And with that, I will hand things over to Rob. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, to get started today, uh, we're just going to do a brief land acknowledgement. Uh, the Rensselaer Plateau sits within the ancestral and traditional homeland and territory of the Stockbridge Munsee, Munsee Band of the Mohicans, who stewarded this land before they were forced to move west to Wisconsin by European settlers. Some Mohican people remained in New York, and some have returned home from Wisconsin. RPA cares for this land today with deep respect and gratitude for the Mohicaninoc, the people of the waters that are never still. We seek to build lasting partnerships with and to amplify the needs and perspectives of local indigenous communities. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce uh, Mary Spring today. Uh, and she's here to talk about the various trees in our areas, how to identify them and what the issues are facing them. She'll explain how to provide quality sustainable forest management with a focus on forest health issues to landowners. Mary Springs Consulting Company, Spring Forestry, was established to provide these services. Uh, she's prepared a forest management plan for RPA's Post and Kill Community Forest and is administering its timber harvest. She also consults to a number of private clients on the plateau. In addition to Rensselaer County, Mary's clients come from a wide number of counties in our area, and her main objective is to best provide generations to come with the myriad benefits that forests provide, such as water quality, wildlife habitat, wooden fiber provisions, recreation, aesthetic, cultural, and regional quality, carbon sequestration, and ecological function. Uh, so without further ado, Mary Spring. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, glad you could make it here tonight to listen to my little tree talk here. Um, I'm sorry for the uh, technical difficulties here because if anything can go wrong technically with me, it's gonna happen. So <laughs> uh, anyhow, tonight I'd like to talk a little bit about um, some of the dom dominant forest types and tree species on the plateau. Um, some of the threats to the future of our forests, um, some different um, things with su sustainable silvicultural systems to foster forest health and uh, continued forest cover across the landscape. And then we're going to have a discussion and question uh, time so that if you anything pops up as I'm speaking, you'd like to ask me a question later on, that'd be great. And I'll do my best to answer. Um, next slide, Dan. Oh, sorry, that was the one I just read. <laughs> so the next one after that. Okay. Um, the dominant forest types on the plateau, um, it's a very uh, northern hardwood, beech, maple, birch dominated forest landscape. Of course, there's acres and acres of uh, hemlock dominated forest, mixed hemlock hardwood, forests, um, some white pine and pine hardwood mixed. And of course, so we've got some oak and pine and other uh, minor associates in there as well. Uh, but it is a very uh, northern hardwood dominated landscape with the uh, associated species mixes that you find um, in those forest types. Um, next slide. Okay, um, some common tree species on the plateau, of course, as I mentioned, uh, Eastern Hemlock, Suga canadensis. Uh, it's one of my favorite trees and it's one of the trees that really, to me, adds a lot of the aesthetic characteristic to the plateau. Um, unfortunately, I'm gonna talk about it a little more in the uh, further slides is Hemlock. And this is something that's really like I say, it's one of my favorite species and it's one of my major concerns for landowners on the plateau um, that I work with, including RPA properties is, um, and I'm sure you've all heard of this, is the hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, it's not quite so widespread up your way, but down here by me in the Catskills, it's been here probably since, right around the, around 2000 was when we started to notice it a lot on the mountaintop. Um, and in that amount of time, <clears throat> it's really started to 
caused considerable mortality amongst hemlock and on a landscape level when you're looking at some of the mountainsides you can really see where it's starting to have a really sad impact. Um, I've been working this past week on a property up in West Kill, um, which is on the mountaintop in Greene County. And there's just, it, it's just kind of heart wrenching to see the amount of mortality that's occurring up there. And it's, it's kind of slowly progressively moving along. And this is something that's been on my radar for a long time. Um, as a concern for Rensselaer County, because like I said, it's kind of just a matter of time um, before it gets there and starts having the same impact. Um, not to go on too long about hemlock on this slide, but um, we also have a lot of American beach on the plateau, uh, Fagus grandifolia. And as I'm sure most of you are aware, it's very heavily diseased with beach bark disease. Um, so that's a major concern um, as well, because beech is one of those species that really is so successful at vegetative propagation from root suckers and stump sprouts, and it's extremely shade tolerant. Um, deer don't like to eat it too much. So it's one of those things because of beech bark disease, in the absence of beech bark disease, it would be a perfectly acceptable species. Um, but because of beech bark disease, um, the presence of it and the prevalence of it and the fact that it kind of outcompetes things that we'd rather have growing um, is a, a real problem, a major concern. Um, we've got a lot of red maple on the plateau, also known as soft maple, Acer rubrum. And what you'll see a lot on the plateau with red maple is that because of the history of uh, charcoal production and heavy cutting of uh, trees for that, and, and too from past logging and things like that, a lot of the red maple up your way is um, coppice, which is means that it's multiple stems coming out of an old stump, um, which is not ideal in terms of timber quality. It's also not ideal in terms of tree health because coppice stems tend to have a lot of heart rot decay in them. Um, so it's just not an optimal condition, um, you know, or you know, quality of red maple. Um, you've also got quite a bit of sugar maple up your way, Acer sicarum, which of course is a very popular and beautiful species. And um, it too faces some problems as far as dieback. Um, I noticed that a lot everywhere I go really. Um, crown dieback in sugar maple. And while there's no one single causal agent of it, I believe it's a complex uh, decline part of a decline complex, which really results from a bunch of different factors. Um, my personal opinion of it is that we have some soil acidification and that's kind of a starting point for the decline because maple likes an, a nice basic soil. When things tend to go a little bit more towards um, an acid condition, it's sort of a predisposing factor to other de um, decline uh, factors and secondary uh, agents that depend on a stressed host, like armillaria root rot, uh, maple borer, things like that. Um, we've got quite a bit of white ash in uh, on the plateau. And of course, we all know about the emerald ash borer. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more um, in the presentation. But uh, white ash has been infested by this really bad little boot-pressed insect that is basically going to effectively eradicate ash in the short term. I believe that in the long term, it may be able to uh, recover from it. Um, there's quite a bit of black cherry um, on the plateau, Prunus serotina, serotina or serotina, depending on how you say it. Um, which is a very commercially valuable species. And because of that, it's a little bit less common to find. Um, a lot of it's been logged over, but you, you, you do see it up there. It's, uh, it's 
still present on the landscape. Um, present too, but in sort of lesser commonality would be red chestnut and white oak, especially white oak is, is kind of hard to come by everywhere. Um, part of that is because the acorns are so palatable, much more palatable to wildlife. It's a preferred hard mast, which of course then makes, makes them uh, harder to regenerate because the acorns are not as abundant. Um, Eastern white pine, it's not super common up there, but um, of course it does occur. And then the associate species, yellow, black, and paper birch are, are pretty common as well. Um, next slide. Okay, um, threats to the future of our forests. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of you have heard these before, but one of the, the big, um, and this pertains to the forest and pest diseases of the day, would be the exotic invasive pests and pathogens, um, which is, it's not a, a new situation that we import these diseases and pests that threaten to wipe out uh, different tree species. Um, <clears throat> historically, that goes kind of way back to uh, the introduction of chestnut blight um, in 1904 was first detected and Dutch elm disease in 1930. Um, over time, as globalization and global trade has increased the transmission of these diseases, and I've always thought it's it's a shame that, you know, 100 whatever years after chestnut blight and Dutch elm disease, then we've got now emerald ash borer and hemlock woolly adelgid that we're, we, we haven't learned anything, I guess. <laughs> but I guess that's kind of the nature of uh, international trade. Um, unsustainable timber harvesting, that's another past and present and future threat to our forests, which has really de badly degraded the resource, um, kind of set us back in terms of what our forests are capable of producing, uh, the quality and the health and the resilience of our forests have been really, really negatively imp impacted by unsustainable timber harvesting. Um, another uh, huge threat, and to me personally, I think it's the biggest threat of all um, that we face is problems with regeneration. And by that, I mean regenerating young forests from our existing forests. Um, it's not so much that we can't get regeneration, but the problem with, with that is that it just does not persist. It doesn't withstand the pressure of deer browse. It's those beautiful white-tailed deer there in that photo that they eat such a huge volume and quantity of the species that we really want to be growing. Um, and it really cannot be overstated or overemphasized the impact that deer are having on our landscape. Um, and it's one of those issues that's it's really hard for a lot of people to accept because, you know, deer are a very beautiful species and but at the same time, they're they're really doing a number on our woods on our future forests. Um, another major threat uh, to, to our forests and not just on the plateau, of course, but throughout the Northeast um, is the loss of forest cover resulting from land conversion to other land use, um, meaning development. Um, that's another issue that's kind of a sensitive subject, but the fact of the matter is that we are losing forest cover and the, the primary source of the loss of forest cover is from development, building, home sites, things like that. Um, and another threat to our forests is, is just from a landowner standpoint and from public policy and everything else is a lack of awareness and misinformation amongst the, the public. Um, people really just, seem not to have much of an awareness of this stuff unless you take part in these type of woods um, webinars and things like that. But um, next slide.
Okay, I, I touched on this before, but this is a major issue that is kind of really we're, we're watching history in the making here with this. Um, and it's a sad history because like I said, maybe before about chestnut blight and Dutch elm disease, those were historically significant things that occurred and, and we're watching the, the same thing happening all over again now with emerald ash borer, um, which was originally introduced to um, Detroit, Michigan um, from Asia via wooding shipping containers. Um, it was first identified in 2002 which was first 20 years ago now. It's hard to believe it's been that long, um, but it's slowly spread from there and kind of taken over the entire Northeast. I believe it's present everywhere now that ash grows. Um, there were some early attempts to quarantine um, wood products within areas where the infestation happened. As we know with quarantine, that's... <laughs> It, it really was not successful in stopping the spread. And I kind of had that feeling from the beginning that once it was here, it's just a matter of time before it's everywhere. Um, so 20 years later, you've, we've got widespread mortality and loss of ash from the landscape. And um, ash is a very commercially important species for lumber, furniture, tool handles, and especially uh, baseball bats. Um, this particular insect, uh, there's no, that I've heard any type of hope that any particular strains are gonna have any resistance to it. The nature of this insect and the damage that the larva does is really what kills the tree. And I don't know of anyone thinking that there's a scientific community thinking that there's any hope for any trees to be resistant. Um, so there's no silvicultural management options to deal with it or to help manage for it. It's just kind of a, it's, it's gonna result in mortality regardless. Um, there's a picture, that's what the little bugger looks like. <laughs> and then the next picture there is um, an ash tree in my own front yard that just over the past year has, um, that picture from last year so it it might have had like one or two live branches on it and now it's this year it's completely gone um it was a really nice ash tree too and that's another thing that's a little bit further along down here in green county um it's present in rensselaer county but it hasn't um the the mortality from it is not quite as widespread as as it is down here um, down here, you drive along all the roads and county roads and back roads and everything, and it, there's just dead ash trees everywhere. So, um, as I said, salvage harvest is the only option, and that the window for that down here is kind of past. Um, like I said, it's it's patchy up on the plateau. There's places where you'll see trees that look like they're not even infested, although I can pretty much guarantee you they are. And um, other places where you do see trees that have already succumbed to it already. Um, that picture is actually from a timber uh, salvage that I conducted for a landowner out in Otsego County who had a very significant quantity and volume of beautiful ash trees. Um, so we decided to go ahead and uh, have a harvest of it. That was back in 2014. Um, it went well. It was kind of sad that we had come to the conclusion at that point was a little bit earlier in the whole scheme of things. But like I said, the landowner had a significant volume there that we just didn't want to lose that volume. We thought it was a waste. And um, not only that, but had we not harvested, there would have been so much standing dead wood out there that it would have been a major hazard. Um, for this particular landowner likes to spend a lot of time out in his woods. So that was, that was the uh, option we went with. Um, next slide, please. Okay, the hemlock woolly adelgid. Now this is uh, 
topic that kind of near and dear to my heart. It's something I'm extremely interested in and um, been on my radar for the plateau and been a major concern of mine for um, my, my clients up that way that for quite a while, um, <clears throat> I've been to several um, events where uh, Dr. Mark Whitmore from Cornell University, who's one of the preeminent adelgid specialists in the Northeast. Um, whenever I see Dr. Whitmore at an event, I always go to him and kind of try and pick his brain and say, you know, what, what can I do? I have landowners with acres and acres and acres of hemlock and, and what can I do? You know, looking for silvicultural options for best management of how to deal with it. And he always kind of just looks at me like, you know, even, even he doesn't know it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of, um, it's really sad and, and concerning to me. Um, but anyhow, um, the Adelgid was first discovered in uh, southeastern United States in the 50s near Richmond, Virginia. Um, the origin of that was traced back to southern the southern region of the Japanese island of Honshu near the city of Osaka. Um, the range of hemlock bully Adelgid continues to expand. Um, it's a very cold and tolerant insect, but each successive generation becomes more cold tolerant, which is what has enabled it to move further north um, and slowly move into higher elevations as well. Um, so since the, the 80s, it's caused excessive or extensive decline in mortality of Eastern and Carolina hemlock in the East. Um, the insect is, it feeds on twig tissue near the base of the needles and it kind of desiccates the needles. It sucks out plant sugars and dries the needles out and causes loss of um, foliage. Um, this particular property that I was on this past week in West Hill, it's got a really heavy infestation of it. Um, you could sit there in the woods and, and just hear the needles dropping off the trees. It's, it's really uh, that loss of needle um, and leaf cover, even though their needles are still a leaf, they're the photosynthetically active area of the tree. Once you lose that, um, the tree starts to, to weaken and decline from that. Um, it causes a reduction of new shoot growth, um, which weakens the tree. Um, the insect itself is dormant most of the summer and then it begins feeding again in late September and October. Um, if you look there, you can see a little schematic picture there of the, the life cycle of it. Um, following initial heavy infestation on healthy hemlock, um, the trees die back, as I mentioned. Um, the adelgid populations decline due to poor host quality and lack of new shoots to feed on. And this decline allows the trees to partially recover and resume new shoot growth which then become infested and the HWA populations rebound. And it's just a cyclical thing that um, is very, very unfortunate. Um, next slide. So there are uh, chemical control uh, methods. Amidacloprid is uh, used widely in urban and landscape settings for a highly valued um, trees. Uh, it's applied to trees individually, and that's very labor and cost intensive. So to apply that on a landscape level to really have an impact across the landscape of trying to preserve and maintain hemlock is a little bit, it's not super feasible. Um, there's also biological control via species of beetles that are predators of the adelgid. Um, the initial focus for that was on Sassagisimus, <laughs> that's a tough one, uh, Suge, um, which is a ladybird beetle from Japan. And mentioning this, this uh, property in West Hill, the landowner um, and his caretaker just as of today had ordered some of this particular um, species of beetle 
and they were going to release them onto the property. I think they had a lot of 150. So that's going to be kind of interesting to see what, what happens with that. Um, recent focus also on the species of Laracobius. Uh, there's two different species of that that they're, they're looking into. Um, family of beet or beet beetles from the family Derodontidae. Um, the problem with these, these predatory beetles is that I guess it's incredibly hard to raise and rear enough of them to have a real landscape impact. But it's one of those things that's kind of on the, uh, on the newer side of things. So it's, it's somewhat experimental and you know, hopefully that they can get something to a level where it's, it's gonna have a landscape impact in trying to maintain um, hemlock because hemlock is such an ecologically important species. Uh, not so much from a commercial timber standpoint, it's, it's not super important and it's pretty low value. Um, but from an ecological standpoint, um, and an, it's just a very important species. Um, the Forest Service is still trying to develop an overall IPM strategy for addressing hemlock woolly adelgid problem in Eastern North America. Um, chemical or biological tactics alone are not going to solve the problem, like I said, on a landscape level. So they're, they are working to try and develop some type of integrated pest management strategy for this. Um, and as I said, from uh, talking to Dr. Whitmore and some of the reading that I've done, um, silvicultural options to manage hemlock are unclear. And a lot of that has to do with the silvics of hemlock. Ordinarily, if you wanted to increase the health and vigor of a tree, um, you would do a thinning, um, put more sunlight on the crown of the tree. And then, as I said, the photosynthetically active leaf area of the tree is going to make more sugars for the tree, make the tree stronger and healthier. The problem with applying that, that theory to hemlock is that hemlock likes kind of a really moist sort of microclimate. And anytime you do a thinning to try and enhance the, the health of the hemlock, you're gonna dry the microclimate out a little bit. And then for hemlock, species like hemlock, it, um, that can actually be a stressor. So in terms of using silviculture and thinnings to try and enhance the health of hemlock, it's not really, it's not really clear what the best option is. Um, as far as um, my clients and, and um, ownership objectives, you really have to determine what your objective is on a stand-by-stand -stand basis. If you have a stand that's really heavy to hemlock, then your management options for that are going to be somewhat limited because if it's predominantly hemlock stand, and we have quite a, quite a lot of those on um, the community forest and post and kill in particular that are 80% hemlock or more. Um, for those stands that don't, they're lacking other species to kind of take over for the hemlock, the situation is even more dire. If you had a mixed stand that had a good proportion of hardwoods in it or oak or maple or any of the other species, you could make the decision to try and shift that species towards the hardwood and maybe thin out some of the hemlock. A lot of this too depends on the quality and the health of the hemlock. Uh, hemlock is predisposed to something called ring shake and it's very, very common and it's somewhat hard to detect from the outer appearance of the tree as to whether it has it or not. So you might look at a tree and say that it's a saw timber tree because it looks fine on the outside and it gets cut down and you can see that it's what we call shaky. And then rather bec than becoming saw timber, then it has to become pulp because it's just lower grade and it doesn't have the structural integrity to be um, lumber. So the whole hemlock issue, <laughs> it's one of those things I think it's going to be the, uh, the story of my career here one way or the other. I'm 
consider going back to school and maybe doing a research project or something with it. Um, I don't know. To be continued, I'll keep you posted. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Okay, um, unsustainable timber harvesting. Um, this is my personal definition of that is that any, it's, this has nothing to do with sustained yield or anything like that, but any timber harvest for which the primary goal is financial gain through the harvest of trees, rather than harvests for which, which are a tool for implementing silviculture to grow, to continue to grow trees into the future. Um, I understand financial realities of the world. Sometimes people get into some kind of an emergency and they need money. But to me, I'm something of a purist when it comes to silviculture and forestry. A harvest should only be implemented to enhance the growth and health of the forest. Or in, like I said, with the ash, in light of the fact that, you know, there's this invasive that's gonna wind up killing it all off. Um, silviculture is the tool that we use to grow forests. Um, unfortunately, the preponderance of harvests that are conducted in the Northeast are not silviculturally based. They're based on which trees are, are most commercially desirable and merchantable. And that of course is just a, a reality of the economics behind everything. It's another, just like everything else in the world, follow the money and that's that's how things are directed. That's how, how, it, how it works. <laughs> um, removal of only commercially valuable trees without removing first the low grade, low value, deformed, diseased or lower value species in a forest. That's another definition of unsustainable harvesting. Um, the term for this is uh, high grading. Um, that's where you would go in and you would take the most valuable, best form, nicest trees out of a stand and leave all the other suppressed and low grade trees, Uggs as we call them, unacceptable growing stock. Um, you know, so in that situation, uh, you are, you're leaving forest cover behind, but the residual stand is just of worse health and vigor and reduced resiliency to forest health threats, as well as re uh, reduced <clears throat> future, future timber value. Um, and that has a really degrading effect over time. And we see that a lot. A lot of our forests have been subjected to that. That's kind of the rule, not the exception, unfortunately. Um, in even age stands, which most of our forests are even aged, um, the best trees that have thrived on that site are removed from the gene pool basically and the runts are left to grow as the future growing stock and seed source. So this really has a really dysgenic kind of effect on the forest over time. Um, this results in stands that have lowered capacity for growth and propagating future growing stock. Um, next slide. So what, what, what is the causal agent behind unsustainable timber harvesting? Um, you know, lots of times you hear people say, well, it's greedy loggers and you know, that's not necessarily the case. Um, it's, it's more re realistically caused by landowners making uneducated, uninformed decisions before having a timber harvest. Um, and, you know, that's not by any, any means to say that, that these people are, are dumb. It's just that there's such a lack of the whole harvest process and the concepts of silviculture and things like that. That, that people just don't seem to know about in general. Um, and so they make poor decisions and um, or they don't use a forester or they're using a, a procurement forester from a, a mill or a buyer. Um, you know, that's potentially ill-advised as well. Um, 
you have to remember uh, the objectives of the forester that you hire. Um, is there a goal to sus sustainably manage your forest or is there a goal to ensure a constant supply of logs to a sawmill? I mean, that's something you really, I, I, I know probably there's landowners out there that have been approached by different mills to say, well, you know, we're gonna do this sustainably and we're gonna make you this, this amount of money and it's all fine and dandy, but um, you know, those, those guys are, are not making their living cutting out the junk first. They're making their living um, marketing the best trees in, in, in your woods. And that really is not gonna set the stage for, for long-term uh, sustainability or, or forest health or anything else. Um, you, you really have to remember how long it takes trees to grow. Um, and to be sure to educate yourself before you have any kind of thinning or timber harvesting or, or anything done on, on your property. And, you know, get, get more than one opinion, talk to more than one forester. Um, I can't tell you how many times I have met with landowners who are educated, smart, wonderful people that have made a, a choice in the past, made a decision to do a timber harvest that they just regret so bad after the fact because it, it takes so long for the woods to recover. It really does. In light of the fact of one of the other issues that I'm going to talk about here in a minute, the, the regeneration problem. If, if you make a mistake like that in your woods, it's going to go beyond your lifetime. That It's not just something that <clears throat> you can recover from that easily, you know. So definitely do your homework before you do anything in your woods. Uh, next slide. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about um, the two silvicultural systems that we have for long-term sustainability. Uh, so one thing, one way to think about silviculture, um, and the definition of silviculture is the art and science of controlling the establishment, growth, composition, health and quality of forests and woodlands to meet diverse needs and values of landowners and society on a sustainable basis through the application of silvics. And silvics basically is, is knowing what conditions and light requirements and things like just how each specific <laughs> specific species grows, the, the type of requirements that it, it needs to grow well and, and do well. Um, as I mentioned before, shade tolerance, I think I mentioned shade tolerance, that's, that's part of the whole picture. Um, with hemlock, hemlock is one of the most shade tolerant species we have. So you're going to be managing for a shade tolerant species a lot different than you are one that requires a lot of sunlight to start up. Um, uh, silviculture, as I've already said, is defined as the art and science of growing forests and employs two basic systems for the establishment, tending and harvest of forested crops, depending on the array and spread of age classes in a stand. So you can think of silviculture uh, similar to agriculture, only instead of growing an annual plant that completes its growth um, in one growing season, you're growing large, long-lived perennial plants that have a very long growth rotation. Um, so there's two basic systems for uh, silviculture. There's even age systems and there's uneven age systems. So an even age system, uh, you're gonna continually have one age class basically. And then eventually you're gonna re regenerate that um, by the use of one of those and that slide is a little bit hard to read, um, but even age regeneration methods are clear cuts, patch cuts, seed tree cuts, shelterwood cuts, coppice, and retention systems. Um, uneven age systems um, include single tree selection system. Now you'll hear the term selective logging and that's a lot different than selection system. Selective logging can be anything from going in and picking out the best trees, that's selective logging, to single tree selection. And um, single tree selection is, is going to try and create a, 
mix of age classes over time so that it's not an even age forest. You're going to have younger trees and you're going to have middle aged trees and you're going to have older trees. Um, and each of those size classes is going to be occupying a similar amount of surface area on the ground. So as you'll picture, you'll have a lot more little trees than you will bigger trees, but they're going to kind of over time, ideally, occupy the same ground space. Um, now, in terms of uh, carbon sequestration, this, from what I'm reading in the science, um, uneven age management is kind of going to be our best way to, to sequester and store carbon um, because you've got bigger trees that are doing the storage. Because you got to remember with carbon, there's there's sequestration. That's the process of growing trees that are pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. And then you've got much older, bigger trees, and those are the ones that are actually storing the carbon in uh, their above ground biomass, their stems and their leaves, and of course the the soil um, biomass as well, the root system. Um, okay. Uh, next slide. Okay, so going back to even age silviculture, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, in the even age silvicultural system, all the trees within a stand are of approximately the same age. Um, I think it's it's within a certain percentage of the total rotation age of the tree. So you know they're not exactly all necessarily going to be the exact same age, but they're they're within a spread, and I think it's. 10 or 20% of the rotation age, I can't remember. Um, but the cohort of trees regenerated at about the same time. <clears throat> the stand is allowed to grow to a rotation age de determined by ownership objectives for financial maturity. Um, then it's cut by one of the even age regeneration systems. Um, examples of even age regeneration systems are clear cuts, shelter wood cuts, and seed tree cuts. Now I know clear cut is a four letter word for a lot of people, but the fact is that in certain applications, it is, or seed tree or shelter wood cuts, it is recommended. If you're dealing with a heavily degraded stand, um, a lot of unacceptable growing stock, disease, uh, infestation, just a really low stocking of anything that's healthy or desirable species. Uh, that is one method to hit the reset button, um, start it over again. And it's, I, I understand it's not a socially acceptable thing to do, but it is uh, silviculturally, if it's appropriately applied in the right situation, you know, it is potentially a management um, objective for regenerating a stand. Um, the downside, like I said, for most people with even age system is the dramatic loss of tree cover in one cut, especially as in a clear cut, um, and a long period of time with no mature tree cover. Um, the system is generally less socially acceptable because of the drastic aesthetic change to a forest. Although, like I said, it is a legitimate civil cultural system for regenerating um, a badly degraded stand or a sick stand or something, you know, along those lines. Um, and like I said, it's it's obviously something that it has to be under the right application. Um, the picture there is a seed tree regeneration cut that I conducted a couple of years ago in Averill Park. Um, the original stand, it had been badly logged a couple times over, beech bark disease, coppice maple with a lot of heart rot, just not a, not a healthy forest. Um, and the landowner was a little bit, you know, he, he recognized what his stocking was. And he just didn't want to continue to grow unacceptable growing stock on his property, which, you know, it, it, it makes sense. I mean, you can have forest cover, as I mentioned before, but if you really look at it and you've got nothing but diseased beach and uh, scarred up, heart rot, just, just 
a sad situation in your woods, um, you know, sometimes it's applicable to hit the reset button. And that's what we did on this property. Um, I went in rather than marking the trees to be cut, I marked the leaf trees, which are the seed trees. So all the very best trees, and there wasn't a whole lot of them, but there was quite a bit of oak and cherry and some of the birches and some maple um, and everything else was cut. And we did not take anything out of there that was not pulp or firewood grade or hemlock saw timber. And it really, it opened up the canopy as you can see. Um, but we're, we're starting to get some regeneration in there and uh, you know, if you're a casual observer and you were to see this particular harvest, you might think, oh my goodness, what the heck did they do in there? But now that I've kind of explained it, that was the silvicultural rationale behind, behind that particular treatment. And of course, it's not something you're going to apply everywhere, but in that particular situation, it was probably the most sensible option. Um, next slide. Okay, and we'll talk about uneven age silviculture a little bit. Um, with the uneven age system, successive partial cutting using single tree selection system or small group patch cuts remove trees of varying size classes and then are intended to create disturbance sufficient to open up the canopy and allow regeneration of a younger cohort, as well as modify stand density to enhance growth rates of the best trees in the stand. Uh, this system aims to create a balanced structure of varying age classes over time, like I, I mentioned earlier, um, but is unfortunately most effective for more, more shade tolerant species such as sugar maple, beech, and hemlock. Um, I, I briefly touched on shade tolerance before, and that is something that you have to take into consideration when determining whether you're using even aged or uneven aged silviculture. Um, there's some species that really like a lot of sunlight to start up, white pine, cherry, um, oak is initially somewhat um, intermediate in shade tolerance, meaning that it will regenerate in some shade, um, but over time it decreases in shade tolerance. Um, so you do have to look at the silvics of the species, your target species, what you have present, what you're trying to grow before you determine which of these two systems you're gonna use. Um, so the benefit of the un uneven age uh, system is that there's a continuous forest cover. There's no dramatic removal of the canopy such that there is with even age forestry. Um, the downside, as I mentioned, is the difficulty in regenerating the shade intolerant species, um, that successive partial cuts and the disturbance involved can result in damage to the residual stand caused by felling and skidding activities during harvest. Um, logging is a, by nature, it's a, a disturbance to the stand and the higher residual um, basal area residual stocking and density that you leave behind, the more um, opportunity there is for wounding and scarring and um, things like that. Um, so uneven age silvicultural systems, um, uh, group selection, um, you can create openings up to a half an acre in um, areas of poorer quality or less vigorous trees. Um, so like I said, if you had a kind of localized patches in your woods of dise uh, diseased beech and yet surrounding those areas, you had some scattered nice red oak saw timber, you could try some um, group uh, selection gap openings to, to create a gap. You'd be removing those diseased beech so you, you wouldn't really be losing anything in terms of healthy trees and healthy forest, and then trying to encourage some of those surrounding seed trees, um, the oaks and stuff to fill in that gap and, and regenerate where you've created that gap in more sunlight. Um, of course, with oak, you do need to do some scarification of the soil, some disturbance to 
create a seed bed for the acorn to get into. If the acorn just lays, uh, lands on top of the leaf litter, it's not going to do anything. It needs to get down into that mineral soil in order to, to germinate and to grow. Um, uh, another uneven age uh, selection um, system treatment includes a single tree selection with canopy gaps. Um, so you're creating a gap in the canopy um, and, and letting light onto the floor. And as I said, depending on the shade tolerance of the species, you know, with something like sugar maple, really shade tolerant, um, sugar maple will will regenerate on its own under the in the understory anyhow on its own so if you create a little bit of a gap there you're going to make that even a little bit better opportunity to regenerate um the maple um so the the it's intended that uneven age forest should have at least three age classes um which is, is kind of hard to achieve. Um, and most of that relates, as I said, to, to the, the deer problem. Um, but in technical terms, um, what they want is, is it's called the re reverse J arbogast structure. So I kind of mentioned before that different size classes of smaller trees are going to take up you know, there's going to be a lot more smaller trees than larger trees, but uh, over over the landscape, they're going to take up about the same um, ground space. Uh, next slide. So we've got a few things that are causing this this problem with uh, getting regeneration to persist. Like I said, it's not not the fact that we can't get regeneration. Uh, oak is a little hard to get regeneration, but other things like maple and uh, birch and uh, um, cherry, you know, we get regeneration with them after harvest. But the problem is that all of that regeneration gets eaten by the deer. Um, so that, like I said, is can't be overemphasized the impact that deer are having on the future of our forests. Um, Northeastern forests have this innate ability to regenerate themselves in the absence of these other factors that are complicating the matter. Um, we don't have to go out and plant trees. I mean, none of our forests were planted. They're all naturally occurring. Well, uh, with the exception, you know, softwood plantations on state land and some other areas like that. Um, but by and large, our forests are naturally occurring and they still would be, and they would continue to be even after bad logging, um, heavy cuts and things like that, if it were not for deer and if it were not for competing vegetation. Um, that's a picture of Japanese barberry. I'm sure a lot of you know what that is, um, which is really terrible invasive, it gets spread spread by birds and stuff. The problem with the berry, it's not quite as nutritive as some of our, our native, um, native species like the dogwoods and stuff like that. Um, barberry, stilt grass, along waterways, we've got um, Japanese knotweed. These things are just so prolific in their, their um, reproduction that they, they outcompete things that we would rather be growing, like the native species and maples and the birch and the beech and oak and cherry and all of those things. Um, and they're really prohibiting the establishment of anything, even minus the deer, um, the, the capacity for those things to outcompete out is just so great that they're, they're hard to overcome. Um, and of course, past exploitive logging. That's another problem that we have with regeneration because we've taken the, the, the prime species out of, out of the equation. They're, they're no longer there to provide a seed source um, for establishing a new cohort. Um, you know, if you've had past exploitive logging that's taken out the, the, the best trees and you've got ones that are 
perhaps genetically inferior, not as resilient as the, the ones that did really well on that site or genetically suited to that site and they're gonna thrive. And when you've taken those out because they're the most valuable trees, you're left with a situation where the, the parent trees are just not there. Um, so that's another factor in, in our problem with establishing and getting uh, regeneration to persist. Um, next slide. So I mentioned this briefly before, and this is another kind of sensitive subject because everybody needs a home. And of course, anyhow, uh, loss of forest cover resulting from conversion to other land use. Um, specifically, I'm talking about development there. Uh, there's two pictures, uh, they're both from Greene County and they're within two miles of each other. Uh, the picture on the left is an area that uh, it's right up on the mountainside. You can see it from down in the valley and it's just a big gouge along the mountainside that was clear cut and it's now they're in the process of putting in uh, houses. I don't know how many houses are going to put in, but more than one. And I don't think it was specifically a family or people that bought the lot and they're going to put up a house. I think it's uh, kind of speculation houses because there's a developer local locally that does that. So that particular patch of forest there is just never going to go back to forest. We've lost it. It's not there to sequester carbon anymore. It's just, it's gone. Um, now the piece on the right, that's on state land and that is young forest, not off in the distance, but right in the foreground there. Um, that was a clear cut on a softwood plantation that dated back to sometime in the 30s. And there was a bark beetle um, in it. So it was really no longer a healthy forest and the state made the decision to clear cut it. And at the time there was of course a lot of negative feedback from the public that they were doing this clear cut. I wanna say it was probably 10 or 10, 12 years ago or so. But you can see this picture was from last year that that's all started to go back to forest now. And that was not planted. Um, it was a Norway spruce plantation. And you can see there's some spruce coming back, but there's also hardwood, there's maples and oaks and cherries coming in there. Um, so that was, you know, a silvicultural application, a legitimate application of a clear cut on a stand that was not healthy. And that's that's going back to forest land now. So it might have looked bad in the beginning, but it's going to be forest again. <laughs> um, and I think that's the end of my slides there. Um, next slide. OK. I guess here's where we open it up to questions. <laughs> yeah, so we've got some questions in the chat. So I'll, I'll just read them out and, and you can answer. And then uh, everyone, if you have questions, just put them in that chat and I'll, I'll read them as they come in. Um, so the first question, I think you addressed it a little bit, but any thoughts or knowledge of working with predators of the emerald ash borer and the woolly adelgid? I'm just actually, like I said, that's this is all kind of on the forefront. And as of next month, I'm going to be working with um, the hike preserve in Rensselaerville. Um, they've got some high priority hemlock stands around their, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Lake Myosotis that they want to save. Um, they're working with uh, Dr. Whitmore from Cornell. And he actually referred them to me knowing my special interest in hemlock. And so we're going to be working on a project there. We're going to be doing some integrated management. So there's going to be chemical treatments and there's also going to be the release of the beetles. And so this is the first experience that I've had with the predatory beetles and integrated um, chemical treatments with that. So 
I'm really excited to take part in that project. And I'm hoping that it's going to allow for a lot of information transfer from that to my landowners. So it's, it's something I'm, I'm really excited about and I will, I'll keep everybody posted as to how it goes and what I learn and how we can apply that to some of the properties up there that I work with. Great, thank you. Um, so next question, a neighbor recently logged as a cash grab. Is there anything that I can advocate for with him to support the health of that land now? Um, well, you know, it, it really depends on, on how the harvest was done. Um, I would talk to him and, you know, like I said, I can't say if it's something that was really heavily cut or if it was high graded, you know, as I kind of mentioned before, you know, once the damage is done, if it was bad damage and I'm not saying that it was, I mean, they may have, I don't know the nature of the logging or, or who did the logging or if they used a forest or anything. Um, but definitely one of the things you could do if it was a heavy cut is to try and get him on him or her um, on the case of looking out for the invasive species that are going to crop up. If you've really opened up the canopy, um, you could potentially be getting barberry moving in and stilt grass and, you know, depending, like I said, if there's a waterway, could have knotweed. That would be kind of the first thing to do, even if the, the forest was degraded and the canopy was really opened up. That would be my recommendation to the landowner is to try and control that stuff just because of the, the fact that it is going to compete with anything more desirable that you would like to have growing in there. So that's kind of one thing that you could do to maybe hopefully help help them to, to get it on a healthy course. You know, like I said, depending on, on how the logging was done. Um, the person followed up and said it was heavily logged the healthy oaks healthy oaks that mm -hmm. were left behind or taken out? I will leave that to the question asker to, to follow up on that. Maybe we can take another question while we wait for that. Um, they were taken out, sorry. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> they were taken out and a huge swath is just fully open to the sky now. Oh, okay. Um, do you have any idea what the, were there any residuals left of any desirable species or was it kind of, like I said, a, a high grade sort of exploitive harvest? It was an exploitive harvest, clearly. Yeah, then at that point, they've, unfortunately, they've, they've kind of, like I said, they've, they've made a bad decision there. The only thing now that you can do is, is to control the invasive species that are going to come in. Um, you know, in that situation, as I said, even if you were to open up the stand and let's say if they did it in a good acorn year, if you could prevent the invasive species and you could prevent the deer from coming in, you would actually get some oak regeneration. Now, it, this past year wasn't a great acorn year. And I don't know when the logging happened. But that's another factor that complicates the oak regeneration is that it has to, if you do a regeneration cut in oak, it needs to coincide with a good acorn crop. So it sounds kind of like the only thing that you could recommend to this landowner now is to, to try and keep the invasive um, plants at bay because that will be the next thing that's gonna, the first thing that's gonna come in and colonize that. Just one quick follow up, and I, I really appreciate being able to um, to to do this series of questions. Um, it was this past winter in the poor acorn year. What I have some oaks on my property. What would happen if, like, can I sneak some acorns from my property onto his? I mean, not. <laughs> I'm not asking you to, to <laughs> about the issues of trespassing. I'm asking about. Um, uh, just the, the, um, obviously the, the, the botany here. Yeah, they, they can be, um, direct seeded from acorn. I mean, if, if you have enough of them somehow collected, you can do that. Sure. Yeah. I would do it the, the coming year. Right. 
Yeah. Okay, yep. that's my plan. Thank you. <laughs> Johnny Acorn seed there. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, so next uh, question. Are people looking to save the mother tree in a forest and the area around her as an island of thriving biodiversity? I'm not sure what you mean by that. <laughs> um, the, mo the mother tree, is this like a, uh, um, the mythical mother tree or is this a specific tree that is on your property that you wanna try the, and- The oldest tree um, that there is that's healthy, that has like, the um, organisms and that are dependent on the kind of microclimate that the oldest tree is providing in the soil and mm -hmm. around it. And are you asking how to improve the health of that particular tree? Uh, do they, are people trying to find the, the oldest tree that's healthy and the little ecosystem around that tree and preserve it when they cut the rest of the forest? Well, that's cer certainly something that I personally would take into account. Um, it really would depend on who the forester is and, you know, if they're using a forester or not. I mean, that's something that I tend to do if I find an overmature. I don't want to say overmature. That's just a technical term in forestry. It's if you find a tree like that, that's it's a really a relic and a high priority tree, in my opinion, I certainly would do whatever I could to enhance the health of that. If you were doing a harvest on the rest of the property, then I would certainly observe that tree. And if there are other trees surrounding it that have some type of problem or they're, you know, I, I might think about doing a timber stand improvement to get those out of competition from it. Again, depending on what the species is, you know, the shade tolerance and things like that. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, this is the last question we've got in here. Is DEC considering increasing the deer harvest to help the forests? Ah, uh, there's, a, there's a good... Um, Good question. DEC, as far as um, giving out doe tags and things like that, for some reason, they are very reluctant to do that. I don't know of any plans that they have to increase, um, you know, the, the doe take or anything like that. So I can't really answer that question. Um, they should, you know, they know that we have a problem um, with the deer issue, but it, like I said, it's, it's very difficult to get them to, to do anything about it. So I, I can't really answer that question. All right, so it looks like there's um, no more questions uh, in the chat. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, other questions they wanna ask, they can turn off their, or turn on their microphone or, or throw those in the chat, but otherwise, um, I think we can wrap up. Thank you so much, Mary, for, for your time and, and for your presentation. Thank you to everybody for listening to me. <laughs>